just wanted to check in a little bit more here on on Plato. Just one point, really. Uh, there's plenty of videos, I know, and I want to overload you, but <clears throat> in the beginning of the second reading, uh, Socrates is talking to Fido, and he says that there's a great danger that they are exposed to, really at this moment, and that is the danger of becoming misologists. That is a strange word. Lest we become misologists. What is a misologist? Misologist is a hater of argument. And he compares it to a misanthropy. A misanthropist is a hater of human beings. Literally a hater of men. Uh, and he wants to make sure that we don't become this. Misologists. Haters of argument. Why are they exposed to that danger right now? Because Socrates has offered his some arguments, some arguments for the immortality of the soul. And then two of the other men there, Simeus and Sebes, have offered arguments against that, or arguments that the soul is not immortal, the soul dies either uh, along with the body or eventually dies, wears out, as uh, Sebes says. And so what it, the, 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 the general feeling is at this point that what's the use of arguing if you can have an argument on one side of the question and then you can have an argument just as strong on the other side of the question then, then what's the point of, of argument if it never really um, brings us to any sort of decisive point I think it's a great question right? uh, but uh, Socrates has lived his life in pursuit of truth through argument, and it's something that he wants to defend. Um, so what is argument? Uh, well, argument is not direct experience, right? Th that is, if I want to find out what color mailboxes are in the United States, I go to the United States and I look around for mailboxes. And if I find some, I'll probably find out that they're blue. So that's not finding something out through argument. That's finding something out through experience. If I want to find uh, what country is directly north of the United States, uh, I look at a map and it's Canada. I didn't arrive at that through argument. I arrived at that through experience. Well, the thing about uh, what happens to us after we die is that uh, there's no experiencing it. That's why it's called a metaphysical question. Metaphysical questions are those questions which deal with matters which are beyond the limits of our experience. Right? Um, classical metaphysical questions like the immortality, like the question of the immortality of the soul are questions like, do human beings really have free will and does God exist? We do not have the means of determining the answers to these questions through direct experience. We can find out what color mailboxes are in the United States. We can find out what country, if any, is directly north of the United States. We can find these things out through ordinary means uh, that we have at our disposal. We look. We can't do that with questions like, does God exist or is, is there such a thing as free will? Does that mean that we have to give up all hopes for a rational understanding of these questions and some sort of answer? Socrates would say no. We can pursue answers to these things through argument, through reasoning. Reasoning on the basis of what we think we know to some conclusion about these things. But how do you do that about a question like what happens to us after we die? Well, I think the first thing to do is to realize or to say that we don't really ask that question in that way. If we're asking about whether there is some part of us that survives death, that is, there is some part of us that is immortal, whether we have an immortal soul, then we certainly can't look and see what happens to the soul after it separates from the body. If we take Socrates' definition of death for granted, 
but we can reason about what we think we know about the soul. That is, we're, we're not going to observe the soul do something or observe it live live on past the body, but we can reason about what sort of thing the soul is. And that is what Socrates does. That is, Socrates is interested in the nature of the soul, and if he can determine what sort of thing the soul is, he might be able to determine whether it's the kind of thing that can die. If it turns out that it is, then we, we, we don't really have any means for saying that the we don't have any any grounds for saying that the soul is immortal but if in our discourse if in our argumentation or argument or argument or inquiry into the nature of the soul it turns out to be the kind of thing that can't die that that is necessarily eternal then that would give us reason for thinking that uh, there is something after death because there's a part of us that is immortal or eternal and I think, generally speaking, that is his uh, approach to the question and what follows. It has been his approach, I think, all along. We don't reason on the basis of some experience we have of what happens to the soul after death. We reason on the basis of what we think we know about the soul and ask ourselves, does it make sense to say that the soul dies along with the body? Well, that depends upon what the soul is. And so uh, we have to have a... a, a a better grasp of that <clears throat> before we can answer the question.